holiday special event. It's the end of the year. We're celebrating new beginnings. We're celebrating holiday projects. Uh, how are you guys today? Hi, Michelle. Hi, I'm I'm good. I'm feeling great. I can smell dinner cooking. So I'm um, looking forward to that appearing on my desk soon. Um, and yeah, last one of the year. Fix my camera just in time again. Just in time. <laughs> Um, you and your camera, oh, Steve. Everyone. <laughs> oh, I don't know why. It just they've done some updates and stuff. But anyway, hello everyone. <laughs> hello, Ali. Hello, Michelle. <laughs> I've uh, gone pure startup for tonight's event. I'm in the garage working on the some garage. new ideas. Maybe the next Google. If anyone wants to jump on board, um, just hit me up. After. Just kidding. <laughs> Are you working um, on your? <laughs> on. <laughs> Well, no, we finished that actually. So uh, I uh, had a team, a uh, few members from IBM and I got together and we entered the Telstra Innovation Hackathon recently. And we actually came first in our category, the smart logistics category. So that was awesome. It was all about um, bringing back your e-waste and trying to incentivize people to do that and having a commercial variant as well. So um, well, you know, we were really stoked about the result actually, but it was really, really cool to kind of present something that they were interested in doing as well. So, uh, yeah, heaps of learning, really fun event. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, welcome to country, Michelle, I'll let you lead this one. You're so good at it. Sure. Sure. As, as always, I tell you, acknowledge that we're getting on, um, the lands of the people who've been here for 65 plus thousand years. And for me in Adelaide, that's the, the Ghana people. And I want to recognise their continuing connection to country um, and extend that respect to the lands on which you guys are meeting from today. Um, I've you know gone on a bit of a journey of understanding more about my country this year um, and different um, places around Australia and their you know history that's uh, not as often talked about. So I encourage you guys over the holidays, if um, you're looking for a good book, um, pick up one, yeah, about the, the country on which you're on. So I can give a few recommendations later if you're interested, but um, yeah. That'd be awesome. I'd definitely be interested. Um, and um, I love, you know, one of the things I've learned this year about the indigenous uh, heritage and culture as well is um, that their idea of community doesn't just involve people, it involves the, the world around them as well. So the, the earth and the animals and, and everything's interconnected and that's all part of the community. And I think that's a, you know, a really great value to have, especially in today's society. So that's something I've learned this year as well. And I'd, I'd love to hear uh, some of those books you'd recommend, Michelle. Um, all right, agenda for tonight. Uh, so we have news and events coming up uh, next. Uh, and then we've got flying in from the UK, the awesome Liam Hampton, who uh, now works ooh, as a ooh. Microsoft Cloud advocate. Uh, we're long time uh, friends of Liam Hampton, and I'm really looking forward to this uh, tiny go on Arduino talk um, about not killing your house plants, something every person needs, um, as well as a kind of a light detector, so making a night light for maybe the kids or something. Uh, next up, the awesome Andrew has uh, volunteered to talk about some fun he's been having with OpenSCAD to make an IP camera enclosure for Raspberry Pi Zero. Did I say that right? Can we say OpenSCAD or OpenSCAD? You can never tell with these things. They're always typed. Um, and, and Tim has offered to give us a, a few lessons on a little project he's uh, been working on tonight as well. So it is open mic. We'd love to uh, for you to share a project um, after these couple of mini talks as well. Um, and oft, after that, as always, a bit of holiday networking um, before we uh, close out the year. And it's been an exciting year, actually. So thanks to everyone uh, that's participated this year to help, you know, build this Oz IoT community and, and give some really great talks. I think by this stage, everyone probably knows, um, actually, what is one of your favourite talks from this year, Developer Steve, while we're here? Um, Love to, that's a good question. One of your most Just going to point out, you or, may have noticed my may have noticed my camera switch. This was intentional because I don't know what the hell is going on with the OBS. I think it needs a holiday break. <laughs> um, but one of my favorite talks, oh, only one. Um, <laughs> actually, South Australian Water. How can you choose just one? Um, so uh, uh, South Australian Water folks, what I thought was always good, but I always love hearing about utilities because, well, we all use utilities. It's so important to everything, day-to-day mm -hmm. -day life. Um, so yeah, yeah, I was. We take I, I, I don't we as well? Yeah, 
yeah, and yeah. you know, so it, the, the amount of water that goes into them, just turn the tap on and we expect water at, at certain temperatures and all the time. Uh, we really mm -hmm. take it for granted. So it's awesome to hear I that. I really like that one as we well do. because it came from, from a recommendation in our Discord as well. Um, so like we you. asked what yeah. you guys want to see and so I was like, oh, I want to see something about, like I think it was energy and then um, – and Tim just put in the chat binary beer was my favourite yes. one, I think, and that's yeah. one that I keep coming back to. It's like an example of something I've learned. And I think in the same day was my mates from the Gold Coast who talked about their little IoT project that uh, the door lock that ended up being like put onto yeah. bunning shelves. It was such a good oh, story. Yeah. And they had some really practical tips on like how to take your IoT like device idea to scale, to scale um, commercializing it. Yeah, we've had some really great talks. And I think uh, one of my uh, favourites, I think, was having Massimo on from Arduino as well. I think that was a really great talk. But, yeah, definitely Binary Beer. Those guys just, you know, are really great educators as well as um, IOTS and that you can just tell they're so passionate about what they're doing, um, which we always love as well. I, think, I like uh, the Josh Massimo. Wally. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, I Josh like the Massimo Wally one because I was in Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to be yeah, we had a few hybrid events too, which um actually went really well, and it was really fun. So um that was that was really cool that we were able to do that this year too. Um, good point, Michelle. Um, anyway, uh, feel free to uh chuck any of your favourites in the chat as well. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and next, I think we've got some news and cool stuff. Uh, developer Steve has we do. put this together. Twice, so uh, I am going but... to go over to you, Steve. <laughs> But, drum roll, I have a brand new IoT joke. Yes, brand new, brand new, I told you. Um, I was going to do, do this at the knock? start, but evidently my camera. No, no, it's not a knock knock joke. Um, <laughs> okay. I mean, for a drum roll. I could code one in, but I don't know. My system's being a bit funky. But um, all right. Hey, Ellie, why did the Wi Fi enabled vegetable strainer cause so many arguments on social media? My gosh, this is convoluted, isn't it? Leaking. It was leaking <laughs> something. No, it was a little divisive. Uh, As in sieve. divisive. Sieve. 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 Yeah. Divisive. Liam's already got the face anyway. yeah. Liam's You've already got, got it on there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should get like a it. drum roll, a, a bit of boots. Anyway, yeah. uh, feel free to share that. It is open source, as always. <laughs> yeah, it's in the middle of my camera. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, with that aside, um, click, please. We have a couple things. Actually, I got a really fun, uh, it's only three things today. So uh, how many kids do you have? <laughs> yep, it was, it totally was. Uh, I didn't say it was a good joke, just saying. Um, anyway, um, as everyone may have, uh, wait, Where's my uh, Uno slide? Did you skip well, one? Well, you said click, you so back? I clicked it. I'll click back. Click back. <laughs> We've you. got this tech down um, hat. Next, we'll automate it with Arduino. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, as everyone may have saw recently, a couple of weeks ago, Arduino Uno celebrated 10 million boards into the wilds of the world. And you think about it, like, that's powering all sorts of amazing projects. So many schools use them for so many different, like, fun little project things. Sometimes for presentation clickers, sometimes for not. I just saw that too. anyway. Um, but um, they did release a brand new version of the Uno. It's a new. Uh, it's the new Uno Mini in a limited edition format too. The boards themselves are numbered, so if you were looking to get one for collectible reasons, I believe Massimo and some of the founding people have signed it as well. Don't quote me on that. There is a whole write-up on their website. Links on the page. Also, one thing there didn't seem to be a whole lot that had changed to the board it, on the board itself, except USB-C and the new form factor. So as you can see, it's a lot smaller. USB and USB-C, yeah. Yeah, I was excited about that too. I was like, finally. We've got those caught yeah. around now too, don't we? <laughs> we do. <laughs> so many of them. And it's so well. Yeah, I yeah, know it's totally been unbelievable, me. really. Like, they really kicked off this uh, kind of, you know, everyone can can use IoT, and they really kicked off this movement. So um, that that's a really, really cool uh, little project, I think. I like it. Hmm. Um, click. Okay. Yeah. That was the bot. I told the bot to do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, this is potentially a fun holiday project because the holiday times are coming. 
and everyone's going to be looking to hack up all their projects. Actually, if you have got something fun that you're doing, drop it in the chat, or if it's going to be a good talk, we can talk next year when we pick things up. Um, this one I thought was relatively interesting. It's called the Miniature 3456 LED Cube. It's called 3456 because there are 3,456 LEDs on that cube. So uh, yeah. it's actually six um, separate LED boards, daisy chained, and there's a custom PCB print uh, as well. So anyway, check that out if you want to build it. It looks kind of fun. You can do some fun animations and things on it. And of course, everything on it is open sourced as well. So yeah, I Amazing. just thought it was cool. <laughs> it does look like a, a um, fun new uh, board game waiting to happen right there. I know, yeah. right? It's like the cube <laughs> board game. Roll, it's roll the be dice. Kickstarter. See what comes up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Big dice. I, I don't know. Yeah, if I right? That. So you could definitely do so <laughs> many interactive, instead of just having a one to six on these cube lights, you could have all sorts of things come up and, you know, um, you develop could. the game, I suppose. <laughs> be cool. Yeah. I'm actually surprised yeah, on that though. I'm surprised there's no more, like not more IoT games. Oh, this one is not IoT related, but kind of is IoT related because of something I did with it. But basically that app.wombo.art is currently doing the rounds the last few days. And it's essentially a deep learning, deep dreaming, learning uh, image creation app. So you put in some words and the word, those things below, those images on that slide, not below, the images on the slide, I made using Internet of Things, IoT, and Oz IoT as keywords. And then it does like some funky machine learning stuff and you basically get a newly created image off the back of it. It's kind of fun. Um, so it's kind of IoT related, but hey. not really. <laughs> no, it's free. Oh, wow. No, it's free. So we all know what we're doing. Just keep hitting it. <laughs> <laughs> I've That's been all. using it the last few days and it's kind of fun. You can literally put your own name in and it will generate like a thing. It's kind of cool. Wow. They're really complex images too. This isn't just, you know, a, you know, a pixel. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Um, it's so awesome. And it, um, it, it, it makes it makes those images within like five seconds. Like it's really quick. I was pretty impressed. So anyway, yeah, we're awesome. checking out holiday yeah, times. Oh, there is a, a long way. Go ahead. <laughs> there is a festive theme as well. So you can like put in a thing, create a festive image and like put it on an email sent to someone and go, hey, yeah. happy it's season. It's your loading holiday happy card holiday. season. <laughs> yeah. Print uh, it as a need a bit of fun than that. <laughs> you, you, you'll have to get on that side for me, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, you could probably put one of those on that cube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. Yeah, never know. That'd be cool. Um, yeah. All righty. Thank, thanks for those cool, bringing in those cool <laughs> Wait, things. Getting some ideas already for our uh, festive season. I can see Michelle. Uh, Michelle, are you on the app now? No, oh, I thought you were like generating energy. <laughs> I was like, what is that? I already experienced uh, I know, right? it, was, it was like a face, oh, but it was scary. It was your face, really? It was a face. It wasn't my face. Now oh, it's gone right. now. Yeah, it does like an absolute. <laughs> an abstract face sometimes when I think what it's doing oh, yeah. is it deep learning very quickly from Google search. So it does a Google mm -hmm. search first and then brings it all back and kind of knows what it's looking at. So that's I think that's what Type it's doing. Type your IoT, Michelle, and see what comes up for us. We'll share that. Didn't developer Steve do one of those? <laughs> did you? Yeah. I, oh, I did. I did those four images on that past slide. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. Internet of things, IoT and Oz IoT. As key, ah. all, as key one, like, all as searches. That's what it came up with. I'm surprised we didn't get an yeah. elephant uh, standing on something from the binary beer talk in the LSOT one. <laughs> well, you, you could try binary beer as a as a search as a thing. That's a, yeah, not a bad idea. Also, no, that's really cool. Um, <laughs> I'm getting some holiday <laughs> holiday ideas already. <laughs> Um, so if you haven't already, which I'm sure most people have, uh, please join our Discord or, uh, you know, just to keep in touch um, and to talk amongst yourselves, um, look at jobs, um, ask questions, um, share projects while, you know, uh, between meetups. Any, there's a cool community out there, so it's great to be able to connect with other, you know, kind of like-minded enthusiasts as well. So uh, we try to be in there and um, have a chat right. as well. Um, so you can, and you can always get in touch with us there too if you need anything. Um, and so up next, I think 
Yeah, binary tech now, Wayne. Yep. So binary beer have renamed themselves to binary tech because they're, you know, outside of their original idea, which was binary beer. Um, but they're doing way more now. So yep, absolutely. Um, amazing guys though. Really impressed by them. Um, but now for the talks. Are we ready for this? Okay, I'll just get a thumbs up. That's such enthusiasm. Thanks, folks. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Well, all the way, I've flown him all the way from the UK. Um, uh, Liam Hampton is up first and he's going to give a chat on uh, Tiny Go on Arduino. Um, and I've kind of got a preview of this talk. So I'm excited to uh, hear more. So, being here with us, Liam. Ah, hello, hello. It's so good to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. And I mean, I could get away with saying I am in Australia because it's still kind of light, but it's, it was pitch black about half an hour ago, but I'm not. I'm still in England. I'm still in London. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate the commitment. We uh, chatted, you know, about half an hour ago and I went, wow, it's really dark there. <laughs> Super early. So thank you for being here. Um, and we'll hand over to you. All right. Fantastic. So you're just going to have to let me know that you can see my slides because uh, I can't actually see. When I get my slides on, I can't actually see. It takes over the whole screen. So just shout at me. Right. Sure. I will let you know when they come up. Thank you. So you should see some code now. And... Now you should see some slides. Yes. We've got the yes. slides. Go to the edge. All right. Fantastic. So hello, everybody. My name is Liam Hampton, and I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft here in the UK. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, on the agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Go is, why people use Go, the popularity of the language, where it's used, where I use it, and a demo. So let's start with what is Go? Now, if you go to golang.org 2021, the latest website uh, for the open source project, you will see this description. And I'm not going to try and rewrite this. So Go is an open source programming language that makes it easy to build simple, reliable, and efficient software. And oh boy, does it stick by that description. Let's touch on a little bit of history before we dive a little bit deeper. So where did it come from? What was it? What's it about? So to begin with, the name actually derived from an animal. And as you can probably guess, the gopher. Fantastic animal, goofy little thing, it's brilliant. Secondly, it is an open source language, which means that you and I can both contribute to it if you want to. And thirdly, it is really, really juvenile. So it is still such a young language. It was created by Google engineers and only released in 2009. So it's you know just over 12 years old, I think. It's brilliant. So secondly, why Go? Why do people use this language? Well, first of all, scaling. So it's great when you're scaling your infrastructure. So it was dubbed the networking language of the future by Rob Pike himself, one of the founders or one of the creators, should I say. And what that means is so many people or so many companies are using this when they're building out their network. So we'll get into some of the projects later, but if you can just think about such a lightweight language and you can, it's so maneuverable within your infrastructure, it's good at that. You can kind of lift and shift, tailor it to what you need, and it's super quick. Secondly, it's got a really comprehensive standard library. And I love this one because you can create super complex projects straight out of the box without any third-party software. And what I mean by that is bringing in imports from, you know, because it's open source, lots of people write their own plugins uh, and their own sort of modules for it, but you don't need to do that. And that in itself increases the security, reliability, and control for your applications within your project. Thirdly, it's type safe. Now this is a bit of a touchy one because they are introducing generics in 1.18, I believe. Um, but nonetheless, it's still fantastic. You really can't go too wrong with it. It's great syntax to write with. And if you're coming from Node.js or Java or JavaScript, it's actually pretty similar and it's really cool to write. And finally, it's cross-platform. And this is probably one of its biggest key attributes. Uh, you can build an executable binary, which is essentially just machine code that runs on the underlying hardware. So you get all of the power from the CPU and the RAM straight away. There's no hypervisor, no virtual machines, nothing in between. Um, so therefore it's super quick and you can run it on different operating systems and different bits of hardware. So how popular is the language? Now I mentioned it's only been going since 2009. And I mean, although that was quite a long time ago in relative terms in computing, that's actually really not too far well, not too far away uh, in language terms. 
So in 2017, only 4.6 of 64,000 developers said or answered this survey on Stack Overflow saying they use Golang in any aspect of their life, whether it's professional or personal projects, which I guess after a couple of years of being out there, that's, that's pretty low. However, that's still really good because in 2021, 9.5% of 83,000 developers said they use it. So we are consistently seeing a growth it's small growth, but it's still quite big in terms of how young the language is and the adoption of this is fantastic. So talking about adoption, where is it used? Where do people use this? What, what projects is Golang used in? Well, the big one is containers. So Kubernetes being the container orchestration tooling for cloud native development and Docker. I guess I hope everybody's heard of those. I'm probably gonna assume you have. And it's all about creating and running containerized applications saying it kind of removes that, you know, works on my machine, doesn't work on yours, that malarkey, get rid of that. And there's a fun fact for you. Both of these actually use Go in production for their CLI. So when you type into your terminal, Docker run or Docker build or whatever you're doing, it's all written in Go. And there's some fantastic CLI toolings for it. One of the most popular, two of the most popular is actually your fave and Cobra CLI, CLI libraries. You know, these have become or made it almost too straightforward to implement your own custom CLI to do whatever you want to do at that level. So Go really helps you do that with sequential and the assistance of concurrency using Go routines. And this, is, this helps you execute many, many tasks at once very quickly, making it really ideal for this job so if you can imagine what you're doing, you're kind of playing with containers, you're touching your underlying hardware, you're, you're creating files, manipulating your file system. So many things you can do within the CLI. Go helps you do that simultaneously with Go routines. And a fun fact for you all, before becoming a developer advocate, I was actually a software engineer at IBM and I created and maintained a CLI which managed cloud deployments and container creations for an open source initiative. And that was my gateway into Golang. Just trying to understand the power of it, where I've come from over the past couple of years, it's phenomenal. Serverless. Serverless is another fantastic um, use case for Go because it's a cloud native language. Uh, you can run it in, I mean, I've got an example of four of the biggest cloud vendors. You've got IBM Cloud Functions, you've got Azure Functions, you've got Google Cloud Functions, and of course, Lambda. So hopefully people are familiar with these, but as long as there's a build pack to sort of build your language or build your code in the cloud, you can then deploy it into that environment and you don't have to worry about the underlying hardware. The cloud vendor takes care of that for you. This is probably one of my favorite slides. And the reason I love it is because it's data science and data science is like renowned for being dominated by Python. And this graph here is from Google Analytics and it shows the adoption of Golang against the data science adoption over couple of years so from 2010 all the way up to 2016 and you can see there's a steady rise you know peaks and troughs like most things but it's consistent it's consistent growth over the years and that's fantastic because you're able to rival a dominant language with a new language it just it blows my mind you know the power the speed the computes behind this is brilliant Next up, we've got web development. Now, the eagle eye will say this is the MERN stack, but you've just taken nodes and put Go in, and you are 100% correct. I have done just that. This is a stack that I actually use for a lot of my personal projects when it comes to web development. This is just a, a three-tier application. You've got your front end, your server, and your data layer. Um, and yeah, it just slides so nicely into that server spot. It's brilliant for APIs. And you can actually render HTML templates if you don't want to use React.js on your front end. You can use some internal libraries. Like I said, it is really, really comprehensive. So you can do so many things. I don't know why you want to, but it can be done. So where do I actually use Go? What do I personally use it for? I actually use it for a lot of fun outside of work. I use it on one of these. And as you may have just seen at the beginning of the introduction, this is an Arduino Uno. And it can take Go. You can run Go on it. Now, that's just saying, yeah, you can run Java on them, all these kind of things, but you can actually run Go. Now, you can do that by using a compiler called TinyGo. And TinyGo is a compiler for small places, as it quite rightly says on the website. 
It's a subset of libraries from the standard library in the core language package. And it's actually based on the LLVM compiler infrastructure, which is a collection of modular and reusable compiler and toolchain technologies for those who want to know. And what it's done is it's cherry picked all of the really important libraries that you'll be able to take and use on a 32 bit chip, which is what's on you know, microcontrollers. Um, cherry pick those libraries into this sort of compiler, and then you can use it as like a smaller version of the language. So you get rid of things like HTML template because you're not going to be templating HTML on an Arduino or a microcontroller. You're probably not gonna be using the net package. You might be using maybe like things like MQTT or byte arrays or IO infrastructure to manipulate, you know, see what's on the hardware. So what's the purpose of this? You know, why, why TinyGo? Why, why am I saying, the language is so great, but then they've got another version of it, which is even smaller, which makes it even better for this kind of, or, or this purpose. Well, I'm saying that because it's compatible for microcontrollers. Now there's over 60 microcontrollers that it is compatible with. Um, here's just a couple of them. We've got the Arduino Uno. We have the BBC uh, Microbits, the Adafruit Playgrounds, X9 Pro smartwatch, similar to one of the smartwatches that you can use for um, JavaScript development, actually. Um, it's fantastic. You can use it in so many different boards uh, in so many different ways. And then secondly, WebAssembly. Now, WebAssembly is, for those that don't know, it just lets you write your, your code your way. So in this instance, TinyGo on your application, you'll pass it through the WASM compiler, so the WebAssembly compiler, which turns the Golang in code into machine readable code so that when you're running this through a web browser, it can interpret it properly. It can understand it. And this gives you near native performance uh, because most modern browsers support WebAssembly. So it's fantastic. You can write your code your way, sort of manipulate it with WASM compiler and ta-da, it will run in the web browser. So looping back to where I use TinyGo. Now to prevent things like this happening, AKA my plants dying, believe me, that plant got a lot worse after that. Um, yeah, I just, I forget to water them. I actually created something like this. And this is a soil moisture sensor sort of notification for me. So it will take the input with the moisture, moil, no, soil moisture sensor, uh, send it to the Arduino, it will do the calculations and give me an output on that little LCD board. Um, and there's also a red light on there somewhere as well. Um, and that would flash when it needs watering. So it's just a notification saying, hey, water me. And as a result, the plant looks like this and it's behind me right now, as you can probably see it poking over my head. Uh, it's fantastic, it grows and I'm looking after it A-OK. -okay. I've also created a nightlight. Now this is essentially how nightlights work. So you use a photoresistor to detect the amount of light from the external environment. And if there is plenty of light, then the LEDs are off. And if there's not enough light that it can detect, then the LEDs turn on. So for those that would like to see, this is the board that I created um, using a breadboard, an Arduino, a couple of resistors, um, photoresistor and a few wires. So it's brilliant. We can circle back to this in a bit as well, if you have any questions. So let's look at some code. But before I jump into it, I'm just gonna let you know, there's two ways we can do this. Now, just like Go has Go Playground, TinyGo of course has TinyGo Playground. And this is just an online emulator. Uh, you can select your board and sort of the code you want to write for it. And you can just tailor it to however you want to do. So you don't need to go out and buy all these microcontrollers or any of these little devices, you can just create it all from your web browser. So at this point, I'm actually going to jump out of my presentation and hopefully you should be able to see some code on the screen. Now I am going to zoom right in and I'll go through this in a second. But first of all, I've connected my Arduino here. As you can see, it is on, you can see the green light and the LEDs are off. So I've plugged it into my computer. And I've written a little program, so I'm, I'm not gonna code this. I've already written it out for us, um, but we'll, I'll walk you through it. So to begin with, uh, I'm initializing the analog pin. So I've got these um, LCDs, LEDs, sorry, plugged into my Arduino breadboard and I need to initialize it all. I have my light sensor plugged in as well and I'm telling it which pin it's at and it's at ADC zero. And I'm configuring that to be, um, but I, I've said it's there, I then need to configure it. I've also configured my 
LEDs again. So in this array, or I say by array, it's not, it is a slice. Uh, so machine.d7, D8, 9, and 10 are the pins that these LEDs are plugged into retrospectively on the board. I'm then configuring this to be an output. So I'm saying, hey, I've plugged them in, make sure that this is going to be emitting something as opposed to receiving something. So I go through each one of those. So each pin, uh, D7, 8, 9, and 10, and I'm saying it is an output by just doing that line there. The next thing I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be looping over every single time there's a cycle just to check um, if there's enough light. So when the light changes, it's dynamic. So I'm saying, you know, if there's light one second, then obviously don't turn them on. If there's not no light the next, then make sure they're on. So to do that, I'm just gonna check. So I would usually do this with uh, 30,000. So this is just a, um, a number for the threshold, um, which will um, indicate the presence of light. This is how it's calculated on, on this. Usually I use 30,000, but I'm not sure how much light we really have in my room today. My camera is massively uh, misleading. Um, so I put it to 5,000. Now, hopefully if I put my finger over it and show you in a second, just like I did in the PowerPoint, um, then you'll be able to see. Uh, so yeah, if there is enough light, make sure those LEDs are off. And if there is not enough light, i.e. else, turn them on. And then I'm just gonna do a delay. And that delay is just a one second delay saying, just iterate through this loop consistently. It's kind of like a forever loop. Um, <clears throat> and, and yeah, we should see that happen. So I've connected it in. I now need to just double check um, that the device is connected. As you can see, I've got a couple of connections here. The Arduino is actually on this one here. So it's actually on a USB modem because, well, USB-C. Got my headphones connected and I have a Bluetooth incoming port. All I want to do next is flash it. So what, I'm, what this command here does is it's saying tiny go. So instantiating the compiler, I want to flash the target board, which is an Arduino on this port, which you can see above, which is slash dev slash cu dot USB modem 11201 and then the name of the file. And the name of this file is night-light.go. So hopefully if I hold this one up to the camera and I flash it, I hope this works. There we go. So you can see the, uh, the LEDs are off at the moment because it's, there we go, and it turns on. So there's enough light, so it's turning them off. There's not enough light, so it turns them on. And that is tiny go on an Arduino. So let's go back to my slides. So one more thing. If you would like to give this one a go yourself, I have actually written a blog on Auth Zero's um, website. So it's published on their blog. Please ignore my title on there. They are in the middle of changing it. But this exact project is on there. Um, I've been playing with this for a while now. Um, so yeah, all the codes. Uh, all the steps you need to take to install the tiny go uh, plugin in vs codes how to install the compiler on your machine because it piggybacks off go so you need go to in be installed first then install tiny go so and so forth um, as you can imagine it takes one from the other so yeah please please have a look at that one um it is well the links at the top but i can get that pasted into the chat as well for you and then finally just a little plug for my meetup group in uh, in London at Microsoft, where we run really cool events. Where I, I talk at these, uh, we have everybody all over the world. We plug because we're remote now, so ignore the fact it says London. London, just um, yeah. If you want to subscribe, give us a subscription there. And other than that, thank you very much. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking through a tiny go with you. And of course, if you'd like to connect, my GitHub and Twitter um, and LinkedIn are at the bottom. Um, and what was that city you lived in again, Liam? Was it Lundo? Yeah, Lundo, Lundo, that one. <laughs> <laughs> or is it just the accent? <laughs> That'd be the one. <laughs> no, I posted the link to uh, that awesome blog. Actually, I had to read through it a while ago and it'd make a really cool, um, you know, little adventure into Go as well as um, Arduino holiday project. So thank you so much for getting up so early and, and joining us to share that uh, with us as well, Liam. We really appreciate that. Yeah, most welcome. It's a fantastic project. And yeah, like I said, if anybody wants to give it a go or have a chat with me about this, because I, I spend my life playing with these things and doing really cool little little projects. So yeah, please hit me up. Yeah.
Uh, okay, well, I just, I'll just i have a quick 60-second uh, interlude uh, whilst Andrew is just checking his microphone uh, before the main event. So my uh, quick 60-second interlude is I went and brought one of these, which is made by a company called M5 Stack, and basically it's a camera. It's a little ESP32-based uh, webcam, and I thought this would be fun to play with because it's a clip-together build-it-yourself. Uh, so I got one, which was great, and then I got it and I pulled it out of the pack and I said, how do I plug this in? I don't know if you can see that, but it doesn't have a USB connector. It's only got a four-pin thing, which is called a Grove connector. So then I said, well, how am I going to get five volts or whatever to my Grove connector to power it? Uh, so I figured I needed some sort of adapter, potentially from a USB socket. So I set about designing a board to do that. Sorry, I think I'm over my 60 seconds already. I'll, no, no, jump, no, fine. Keep going. <laughs> I'll jump over here quickly. I won't tank long. Sorry, Andrew. Uh, so I started with KiCad, uh, and I designed a little PCB. And if you can see over here, I got my USB socket, and then I connected that to a power regulator, and then I connected that to a Grove connector over here. So I thought, this is great. This is going to work, and it'll be fantastic. And so I was about to send this off to get someone to make it for me, to print the PCBs and make it. And then I thought, well, but I've got these other two pins. What do they do? And it turns out these other two pins in the Grove connector are for an I squared C or I2C bus. So then I thought, well, great. Well, I may as well use those. And if I've got a USB port, I'll go and get an FTDI. Uh, oh, well, sorry, this has been updated. The actual board has an FTDI uh, 232 chip on it to interpret the I2C bus and expose it as a serial interface uh, via USB. So I thought this was going to be a great idea. So I uh, sent this off and I got it made. And a couple of weeks later, I turned up one of these. Uh, and I thought, this is great. So I turned around, I plugged the USB-C port into the laptop and it came up and said, invalid device. And I thought, oh dear, what have I done? <laughs> so I then uh, went back to the diagram and I discovered that I'd made a pile of mistakes and I'll just share the first one with you and then I'll uh, see if Andrew's got his microphone working. So the first main mistake was I had a USB connector and I thought, great, I need one uh, data positive and one data negative line. So I used both of those and I connected them into my uh, uh, regulator, oh, sorry, into my FTDI chip. And then I now realised that it actually had four available, but I only used two. And now I realize why there were four available, uh, because there's two on each side, because USB-C plugs are reversible. So you can have, you've got a positive and negative on one side and a positive and negative on the other side. And what I've actually chosen here was one off the top and one off the bottom. So, so um, that's basically why it didn't register properly in uh, on the computer when I plugged into the USB socket was because I didn't use the correct pins. I should have used uh, A7 and A6 would have been on one side and B7 and B6 would have worked on the other side. So that was my first failing with trying to design a circuit. And I probably should have figured that out before I sent it off and got someone to make it. But uh, anyway, that was lots of fun and I uh, learned a lot from it. There's a bunch of other mistakes, but uh, I don't want to take up too much time. So I'll um, I'll hand back to uh, Andrew if he's still with us. I think he's either refreshing or taking a moment. But um, no, thank you for that. That was really cool. Um, one question I did have was, did you, how did you go about sourcing where to get a print, like printed? Did you look at a couple of different options or like, did you already have somewhere in mind? Yeah. Or? I ran the schematic and then I laid it out on a board and then I went off to a place called LCSC, which are in China and I uploaded it to them and then they came back and said, we can't match the part numbers. We haven't got any availability, pick new parts. And then I got really frustrated because it takes a long time to go and search all the manufacturers and find the part to do the thing that you want. Uh, so then I went over to another site called PCB Way, which I think is also in China. And uh, I uploaded it to them. And then they said, great, we'll figure it out and deal with it. And they sent me an email and said, we're going to swap this resistor for this and this capacity for this. Are you OK with that? I said, yeah. And then they made it. Uh, so wow, that was really that's good. really cool. 
it was, it was good service. Um, it was really easy to use. It wasn't particularly cheap. Getting the actual boards was cheap, but once you pay yeah. for all the components and the pick and place and stuff, yeah, they're about ten dollars a board. Which ten dollars for a little power yeah. converter is a bit overpriced. Well, but I had a lot of fun uh, making it. Exactly. Particularly small batch too. Yeah. Yeah. Like you didn't have to produce ten thousand of them just to get six. <laughs> Yep, upcoming what? events, Melbourne Steve. Sorry, I thought oh. you. Were, I thought you were oh, on a roll. Oh, I was thinking. Oh no, Ali lost her <laughs> audio too now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, on a roll. Um, we do have we do have some upcoming events. Actually, there's only one because you know end of the year and start of the next year. But um, I just wanted to highlight. I mean, most folks are probably already aware of Linux Conf. Um, has a really big um, IoT presence, but. Overall, it, I mean, the whole uh, event is very much open source themed with an amazing community and totally worth checking out if you haven't already got a ticket. Um, yeah, some great folks, some great talks. Um, and we will stay tuned for our next event. Uh, we'll, we're going to take a break just like everyone else, but um, we'll, um, we'll announce our next event sometime towards the end of January, maybe February. But um, Stay, keep an eye on the page and also join the Discord too because we always have some great conversations in there. Actually, we had a conversation the other day where I posted the link. I don't know if everyone saw. Um, I'm going to say creepy cool robot because as a technologist, um, this is the, the robot. It, was, it made some mainstream news too, but it actually did facial expressions like really well, a little too well. But I appreciate <laughs> as an IoT, I appreciate the um, IoT componentry involved in doing such a thing. And I, there were some conversations on Twitter about people saying the same thing. Like, I know this is literally just some really good servos and such, and but it's still creepy because it has some very yeah, human expressions. Better expressions. than some people that I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was weird, but um, kind of cool. I don't know, conflicted. Anyway, um, stay tuned for our next event and join the Discord if you haven't already. Yeah, definitely. And, and once again, just from me as well, big thank you to everyone that's contributed to this community, posted in the Discord, come to one of our meetups, watch one of our meetups on YouTube. Uh, we couldn't do this without all of you uh, being supportive and being invested in, in learning more about IoT and coming to these events. So big thank you to everyone for making this community what it is. Uh, we really do appreciate you. Um, all sharing and helping helping us out with, with things like jumping on at the last minute. So thank you, Andrew um and and tim as well so happy new year to everyone from me um and let's jump back to the tables and and have a chat yay thank you all